Welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. We aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools in these sessions. Each month we hear from our local and international peers who will present a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. My name is Christina Hall and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Manager. We particularly appreciate those of you joining us live today. You'll have the opportunity to ask our speaker questions via the Q&A function on your dashboard and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This session will also be recorded and you'll find it on our YouTube channel along with recordings of previous webinars and workshops. We hope you'll keep in touch to hear about future webinars via the channels listed on the screen here. Before we start today, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, learn and work. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Kirsten Howe, who's the Senior Scientific Manager at Genome Reference Informatics at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. Equipped with a PhD in genetics, Kirsten started working at the Sanger Institute in the year 2000. After two years working on the reference annotation for human and C. elegans genomes, she formed her own team to analyze and improve genome assemblies. Her team initially focused on zebrafish genome assembly and subsequently expanded in scope to the human, mouse and chicken reference assemblies as a founding member of the Genome Reference Consortium in 2008. Kirsten and her team led the validation, uh, lead the validation of the assemblies produced by the Vertebrate Genome Sequencing Project and the Darwin Tree of Life Project. Today, Kirsten will challenge us with the question, so you think your genome assembly is good enough? So welcome, Kirsten, and I invite you to start sharing your screen. Um, it's early morning here, but good afternoon to you all, and thanks very much for extending your working day by listening to what I would like to talk about today. Um, if you think that this talk is about the newest assembly algorithm or about the newest sequencing technology that is also promising and will solve all your problems, you might be a bit disappointed because this talk is all about what happens when this is all already applied and you think that you have the final product in your hands. Um, to go a bit back in time and uh, refer to um, how Christina just introduced what I've been doing over the last two decades, this is more or less exactly where we thought we were uh, in the early 2000s when we produced the first zebrafish genome, because we had already um, gathered experience um, assembling human and mouse, and it was all easy and straightforward, so the next assembly surely would work in the same way. It didn't. It was far more complicated than we thought, and it actually made it necessary to form a team that was dedicated to improving the assembly that came out of all these technologies and algorithms. And armed with that experience, um, we joined the Genome Reference Consortium that looked or then started looking after the human and mouse uh, reference genome um, because we found that um, there was still lots of room for improvement and someone had to do this, improve those reference assemblies for the scientific community and made sure that they were uh, publicly accessible and maintained. Um, we gathered some more experience by not only looking at the Genome Reference Consortium assemblies, but also at the um, assemblies of the um, Vertebrate Genome Project that started a couple of uh, years ago that aims at sequencing all vertebrates um, in this world, starting with an ordinal representative. Um, so about 260 vertebrate genomes to be produced just now. Um, at the Sanger Institute itself, um, last year we started the Darwin Tree of Life project that aims at um, sequencing and assembling all species on the British Isles over the next years. Um, obviously those assemblies also needed some uh, tender loving care. Um, and we've also recently been involved in the Telomer to Telomer project that aimed at and actually achieved, as announced uh, two days ago, the first absolutely finished, this time really finished, human chromosome of the um, genome assembly of a single uh, cell line. Um, we are also involved in the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium that has started recently um, in order to provide the first 
um, really pan species uh, genome graph, um, making sure that um, all populations on this earth are reasonably represented um, in high quality um, human genomes that can be used by the scientific community and also the medical community for all their analyses. So looking after all these assemblies, um, we obviously get some, gain some insights. And the most important insight is, as I already said at the start, the perfect data type and the perfect algorithms sadly don't exist yet. There is no single sequencing data type and no single sequencing technology that you can use exclusively and get to a really good assembly. It's just not there. At the same time, if you combine technologies, the algorithms and strategies are currently sadly not sufficient to give you uh, an equally desired outcome of a nearly error-free, well, at least nearly error-free, um, let's say largely flawless assembly. So there is still some work that needs to be done. Uh, in addition, if you're not working on um, human assemblies, many algorithms are trained and optimized for the use on human data. So you got a bit of a problem there. And even if everything else is fine, um, you probably have encountered the problem yourself that when you thought you had it all reined in, weird things tend to happen. So that's where we come in. Um, we do assembly curation. Um, and in a nutshell, we receive assemblies from our assembly team that has applied all automated methods that they are under the sun that we've approved and that we've agreed on. They give us the finalized assembly and we then throw it into our pipelines. The first thing we do is we remove artifacts like vector and adapter contamination, trailing ends, extended gaps, etc. We are also screening and removing contamination. Um, at the same time, we are setting, we are identifying and setting apart organelle genomes because they should not be part of the primary assembly. And we are also looking for sequences that come from possible cobions that were present in the sample and sequence. We then go into the meaty bit of the assembly curation, which is trying to reconcile the produced assembly with all the available raw sequencing and mapping data that we have. And whilst doing so, we are assuring that all this data really maps where it should, because if it doesn't, there's something wrong with your assembly. Um, so we are assuring that this is the case, and we are assuring that all the structure that the assembly has is actually compliant with all these, this data. And if it isn't, we change the assembly, and we do that manually. Um, whilst doing so, we are identifying and naming chromosomes. And of course, all this leads to, uh, in a close feedback loop, to us providing information on our findings and thereby improving the assembly strategy and also the assembly software because we are working closely together with people who develop all of this. So what I would like to talk about today is um, how we do this and I hope I can convince you that it's worthwhile doing. And if you think so, then I'd also like to show you how you can do it if you're so inclined. Um, so as I said, um, we start with the assembly that we are handed, the assembly that has been um, produced by uh, taking all the raw data that has been uh, accumulated for a certain project, has run through whatever assembly pipeline, and um, this is general. So we are not specialized on a certain type of assembly process. We take anything that comes. Um, might that be old clone-based assemblies? Might that be newest technology? Pack bio hi fi, might that be intermediate chromium 10x uh, supernova assemblies, anything that comes. Um, the final lysed assembly coming out of the automated processes then goes through the decontamination process and the process where we set contexts and scaffolds apart uh, depending on whether they really should belong to the primary assembly, should be discarded as contamination, or should be set aside as organelle genomes or cobion genomes. And we then go into the big process of collecting all the raw data and trawling the whole of the internet for any other data type we can find on the same species or on closely related species. And we align all this to the assembly that we've been given. And we make these alignments visible in something that we call the Genome Evaluation Browser, or GVAL. And that is basically uh, a browser that's built on the ensemble framework, but it's not focused on 
um, showing you genes and functional annotation, but rather totally focused on sequence quality and the, um, the compliance with the aligned data. Um, the data is not just displayed, it's also evaluated. So there's a color code uh, for allowing the curators to uh, easily spot whether something is wrong or correct in a region that they're looking at. At the same time, you see that here at the bottom, um, at the top right um, of the, the little depiction here, um, we are providing punch lists where we uh, list all the issues that take up with the assembly, for instance, all the genes that are uh, split, not in the correct order, incomplete, etc. All the points where, for instance, optical maps disagree, etc., etc. This all depends on the type of data that you threw at the assembly in the first place. Um, this then goes into manual curation, and I uh, tell you a bit how we do that in detail uh, later. But GVAL is not everything. Whilst designed to be the one-stop shop for all your assembly curation needs, in the last two years we um, discovered that yet another data type, and that is high C data, makes an incredibly valuable contribution to the whole curation process. High C maps can't really be integrated into GVAL, so that's the one thing we use on the side. We analyze um, our data in 2D high C maps that we generate with a variety of software depending on our individual needs. So once we've looked at all that data and made all the changes that need to be made, we produce the final assembly. And that really is the final, final assembly because that then gets submitted to INSTC. So GenBank, DDBJ, ENA, wherever you sit, whatever is appropriate. If you look at GVAL, uh, here's an example of the region. And you can see um, in blue here, uh, horizontally, the actual sequence uh, of the assembly. And aligned to it um, are a variety of data types from top to bottom here, the PacBio read coverage, gene models are annotated. Um, they, they, in this case, have come from a closely related species. Um, but they were good enough to map. If they're not good enough to map, we map, map the um, protein sequence rather than the um, CDSs from the cDNA sequence. Um, you can then here see um, intermediate assemblies that went through different scaffolding stages aligned in gray. You can then see regions that have zero depth in the PAC bio alignments. You can see marked out centromeric repeats. If we know about these or likely centromeric and telomeric repeats that we know for the species, then you get the uh, reverse G model track. Then down here, you get bio nano map alignments, so optical map alignments. And as far as I know, GVAL is the only browser that actually shows you this. No other browser shows you bio nano map alignments. Uh, and here at the bottom, there's a synteny track where um, matches get colored according to the um, chromosome they hit in a related species. In this case, we are looking at zebra finch, um, and the synteny here was recorded against chicken, and the bottom track is repeats. But as I said, this is uh, totally variable depending on whatever species you're working on. And I hope that you see immediately there's something wrong. There's something wrong right in the middle here because all the bio nano maps stop aligning. There's a break here. There is a break in coverage. There is a break in synteny. Something is wrong. And if you look here at the previously aligned, uh, the previously produced intermediate assemblies, you can see that there has been made a join between two primary contics in the very first produced contic level assembly. And this join is simply wrong. So the curators can go here, mark this up as something that has to be broken, and they can then interrogate GVAL in order to find the join that should have been made and make that. Um, I already talked about punch lists. They are, again, really dependent on the types of data you have for your project, and you can list whatever you want to mark out um, as having suboptimal or, or really no alignment in your assembly. I said that we are also using high C maps. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with high C maps, so I'd like to quickly show you what, what you should and shouldn't see in high C maps. So the idea picture is here on the right. You have signals that depict where a connection has been found because we are between two sequences um, in the genome. And the gray lines here are the scaffold boundaries. And ideally, every scaffold should represent, represent a chromosome. So you will find signals from places inside this chromosome to other places inside this chromosome, but not outside. So there should be nothing off diagonal because 
Otherwise, it would be in the same sequence, and it's not because it's a different chromosome. At the same time, you sh should have a nice diagonal through the respective chromosome with sort of uh, slightly um, declining shading um, towards the um, top right and bottom left. That indicates that the sequence inside the chromosome is correctly assembled. If you look at the left here, this is what we often find with our assemblies, where you get lots of off-diagonal signals that indicate that joints that should have been made between scaffolds simply haven't been made. But it's not restricted to the inter-scaffold issues. Um, you can also look at intra-scaffold inconsistencies as depicted here on the bottom left. Here you can clearly see that something is not quite right and the um, letters here and directions or, or orientations on the right show you um, that the A, B and C components that should clearly be cut apart in this scaffold can be rearranged to form the picture that you would like to see. Whilst this is a uh, visually attractive and easy to resolve. Uh, I have to really loudly shout out a warning. Um, please do not trust a single data type. Always consult as many as possible because a single data type can really lead you astray into believing you've solved something when you haven't. Um, with that in mind, uh, let me introduce you to some common assembly issues that we find. Um, the first one, and the one that's really easiest to spot, but often forgotten, um, is what I've listed here second, and that's the trailing ends. Many assemblies get produced that still have trailing ends. Um, if you submit to GenBank, that is not really a problem. They'll tell you and send your assembly back and say, yeah, um, cut that off. Um, the other INSDC archives sadly don't. Uh, I'm, I have to admit I'm not entirely sure about DDBJ. ENA certainly does not complain about this. So you really do not want to submit an assembly that starts and ends in ends unnecessarily. What you also don't want to submit necessarily is a sequence that is basically just gap, as in this example. Um, we mark out gaps in red. So if you see something like this, where you have a whole context that's basically more than 90% just ends, you might want to rethink and check that the two ends of this context really belong together or whether you can do something else with a unique sequence in it. Um, another sadly very common assembly issue is uh, contamination. One of the earliest encounters we had when we uh, started the Vertebrate Genome Project was that we investigated links, the new links assembly. And um, the first thing that the contamination check spit out was that there was rice in the links assembly, which came as a bit of a surprise. And a bit of uh, investigation showed that there had been a mix up with the um, smart cell identifiers. So um, rice was also sequenced at the same sequencing center and the wrong data had been incorporated into the links assembly. This, of course, is easily rectified. You just need to know about it. But ever since, we always run all our data against all other data before we even start the assembly in order to check whether they really come from the same species. And here in the uh, bottom left depiction of a mesh map run that was done by Sergey Corrin at the time, you can see that the two smart cells that came from RISE really have nothing to do with all the smart cells that came from LINKS. Um, what you also find uh, is usually quite a bit of adapter contamination, vector com contamination, other common contaminants in eukaryotes. I would always recommend to check, um, as with the rice here, uh, check against everything you are currently also sequencing in your labs, uh, because there might be another mix-up in the lab. Um, I already said earlier that we separate organelle um, genomes and what you sometimes find uh, in long read assemblies, more commonly so in short read assemblies, are contexts that are basically only uh, mitochondrial or plastid sequence. Um, they're usually characterized by uh, being long tandem repeats of themselves. So here you see um, one of those contexts um, on the horizontal aligned against the real mitochondrial sequence uh, on the vertical axis. And you can see that you have one, two, three, and something repetitions. Um, what you also have here is a bit of unique sequence that does not align to the mitochondria, um, mitochondria sequence. And it's very important to check with those contexts whether you are looking at a full organelle genome that should be set aside or whether you are looking at a so-called new mite or 
Nupt Newpite uh, pronunciation is still to be decided, I believe. Um, that is a valid sequence within your genome because the organelle sequence has been integrated. Um, another very common thing are uh, structural problems. Um, here, for instance, you can see there is an inversion. Uh, and you can easily spot this because it affects a gene. Um, we mark up our genes in green if there's nothing to complain about, yellow if they are slightly off what you would expect, and red when they're really off. And you can see here that this particular gene is red because its other half is here on the opposite strand. And you can easily see what happened here in the primary assembly. The contacts were simply incorrectly joined where the red arrows indicate. And you can easily cut that apart, turn it around, fix that gene. And as I said, we are providing gene punch lists that allow you to interrogate all those genes that don't really have the structure you expect them to have. Um, what really riddles assemblies, um, and I really can't stress that enough, are duplications, false duplications. So very, very often repeats don't get resolved correctly, which might not be your first uh, worry because uh, not everyone is necessarily uh, really into um, sort of detailed repeat analysis. But what happens in addition very often is that assemblers can't really tell um, haplotypes apart in your species. And instead of uh, separating them, they concatenate them, as has happened in this example here, where you can see that this gene is there twice. Uh, again here we have um, a join between two primary contexts, and I hope you can see my mouse. Um, we have an area where the bio nanomaps uh, mappings are off, as you can see here in red, and you can see at the bottom that the whole area is in there twice. So you just need to cut it out and then everything falls into place and it's fine. Uh, and lastly, the really meaty bit is all those missed joints and all those missed joints that have not been made by your scaffolders that need to be resolved. So here's an example of a zebra finch assembly where you can see quite a lot of issues um, that we encounter. You can see that joints have been missed, uh, as in, for instance, this scaffold um, with its off diagonal signal really uh, obviously belongs to both these and these scaffolds. So you can join all three of them. You can also see that things have been joined that shouldn't have been joined. Like for instance, in this scaffold that should be cut into two, this scaffold should have been cut into three, this and even more different ones. Here you can see there are clearly two different chromosomes involved in this scaffold and they have an internal rearrangement as well that needs to be fixed. Um, what I showed here on the right is uh, sometimes you have the opportunity to align your assembly against an older um, or other assembly of the same species of, or of a very closely related species. And if you do so, um, you might see that you get um, longer matches of your scaffolds and then you get the, these sort of, uh, well, sort of one side of a Christmas tree like extensions. And what basically happened here is that you have breaks or gaps in your scaffolds with tiny little contacts that should have been put into this gap, but weren't. And in that case, it's really left to you whether you want to go through all this work and put all these tiny little scaffolds in. Maybe that just wants uh, to alert you to the fact that the assembly method you have chosen here is not really the optimal one and, and turn to something else. Um, after all these rearrangements are done, etc., cetera, um, we add some value, as I said earlier, to the assemblies by identifying the chromosomes in the assemblies. Um, ideally and historically, this has been done through karyotyping and FISH. But uh, once you're working with a high throughput project that aims at generating multiple assemblies, lots of them, um, so um, our PI Mark Blackstar anticipates that we will have to do 10 high quality assemblies per day um, in the coming years. Um, both karyotyping and fish is absolutely not a possibility anymore. So we are currently belie believing that high C provides a suitable alternative. Uh, by providing us with an inferred karyotype. And um, we use the high c 2D maps of the finalized assembly in order to identify chromosomal units, as you can see here on the right. Um, we, of course, try to reconcile that with published karyotypes where possible. Um, but high c with good software and really good resolution, has also allowed us to identify additional chromosomes that uh, were 
previously not really possible to see, um, for instance, some microchromosomes in birds. So this is um, a, a quite good method that then, if you identify new stuff, obviously you have to verify it then. But um, this really is uh, a good possibility of identifying what is a chromosome and what is not. Um, another thing that belongs to um, chromosome identification, obviously, is chromosome naming. Um, in many evolutionary projects, um, it's preferred to name chromosomes by synteny, so that if you talk about chromosome 4 in a certain clade, uh, everyone knows what that is and everyone knows they relate. Um, if you want to go along with this, um, as we do in some um, projects, we um, use synteny for naming the chromosomes and we do so by simply aligning um, the newly produced assembly, as for instance here on the uh, y-axis of this Nukmer plot, with um, the species that we want to name it after. And if the relationship is clear and unambiguous, we just go ahead with the existing naming for the other species. Um, what also usually is quite successful, if you simply um, check for gene space completeness with Busco and then look through all the Busco genes where they um, reside in the um, chromosomes of your um, species that you want to name your um, chromosomes after and uh, where they reside in the species um, that you're investigating. And you can usually see that there is a very unambiguous signal then um, that lets you, well, in many cases, you can see that um, it's a worthwhile undertaking. You can easily identify the chromosome name that should be given. If this is not what you desire, um, you might want to name your chromosomes by size. And here it is important that you might have identified the full chromosome, um, for instance, here in chromosome two, three, and four, but you might have also identified scaffolds, as here uh, is depicted for chromosome one and five, that you know belong to the same chromosome, <coughs> excuse me, but you can't quite join them up. You don't know which way around in what place they go. Um, we call these bits of sequence unlocalized, following the uh, nomenclature um, given by INSTC. And we say the larger part, like this here, is chromosome one, and the smaller part is chromosome one unlocalized. And this then gets added um, to the primary assembly as such, and named as such, um, but then the naming by size needs to take these bits in account as well. For instance, if you don't do this, then chromosome two would be longer than your main part of chromosome one and the naming would be different. So if you name by size, please take all the unlocalized bits into account. Ultimately, uh, I don't believe it matters too much what you name your chromosomes as long as you keep the naming consistent. What you absolutely never should do is changing names, obviously, if you release uh, a newer updated version of your assembly. So as long as you keep everything consistent, go ahead and do whatever fits your project. Um, another bit of added value is that um, this whole chromosome investigation allows us, uh, at least in many vertebrates, to identify the sex chromosomes. Um, you know that sex chromosome identification and <coughs> sex determination is not the easiest topic and uh, it's easy in mammals where they mostly have XY. Um, it's somewhat okay in birds where they usually have ZW and then all bed cells. So um, there are so many different ways of sex determination. Um, it gets even more complicated when you are leaving the vertebrates. So uh, many different possibilities. In the easier cases, we do it by synteny, as you can see in the top right. Um, the high C maps also guide you a bit towards the um, sex chromosomes by showing the reduced coverage that you would um, expect because they are um, only present in one haplotype, so they only have uh, half the read coverage. And you can see that here in the high C plot of uh, the uh, Kakapo assembly, I believe this is, um, but you can clearly identify the Z chromosome and also the W chromosome simply by its coverage. We, of course, would not go by um, reduced coverage alone. We would always verify that. But this is a good indicator of where to look in the first place. Um, this all might fail. And then another possibility is to identify core genes that you are expecting on your sex chromosomes. But that, of course, requires some previous knowledge. And in some cases, we get this from additional experts that we are um, sort of uh, recruiting in order to tell us what to look for. <coughs> 
Um, I'd like to say another thing about organelle genomes. Um, I already said that you sometimes find them, uh, sometimes you don't um, in your assembly. Um, this all depends on uh, read length cutoff, etc., and the uh, type of technology and uh, assembly strategy, strategy you're using. If you find them, set them aside. Um, there are separate assembly pipelines um, available that um, target um, the assembly of organelle genomes. For instance, MitoBGP is one um, possibility here. So do that in order to produce um, good organelle assemblies. But the most important bit here is that once you have your organelle assemblies, add it to your as full assembly before you are polishing everything. If you don't do that, and no, or no organelle genome is present during polishing, then if you have new mites or new pites in your um, nuclear genome, all these surplus mitochondrial or plastid reads will go and polish your uh, integrated organelle genomes away. We have seen this in uh, Zebrafinch, where the first assembly was produced and polished without a mitochondrion present during polishing. And what we then later discovered was actually a new mite in um, both haplotypes uh, of a haplotype resolved assembly of the same sample, um, were totally polished into a fully functional mitochondrion just because of the uh, surplus presence of mitochondrial reads that convinced the polisher that this sequence should look like something else. So please make sure that an organelle genome is present during polishing. So after doing all this, <coughs> this is what it looks like. We've curated so far 172 assemblies. Um, that's nearly 250 gigabase pairs. And on average, we make 243 manual intervention per um, one gigabase pair of sequence. Doing so, the assembly length on average decreases by 2% because we remove false duplications. We currently don't resolve collapses, which would of course increase the assembly length, but this is something we're working towards. And also whilst doing so, we are on average increasing the scaffold N50 by nearly 60%, um, thereby reducing the scaffold count by about a third. And uh, I, I again would like to point out that scaffold N50s are a nice thing to have, but they are not wisdom's last resort. You should not go for the best possible scaffold N50 you can achieve, because as you can see on the right, where we depict the scaffold N50 changes that we achieved in different assemblies, you can see not all assemblies end up with the scaffold N50 increase here above the um, zero line. There are quite a few assemblies that have their N50s reduced when curated because they were terribly over scaffolded to start with. So a high scaffold N50 is no guarantee for a correct assembly. Once we've done all this, um, we assign to chromosomes, as I said before, and we achieve an average assignment to chromosomes of 98% of the sequence. And when you then look at the high C maps before um, curation, they might look like this. And in this case, this is a Zebrafinch map. And here we aligned two independently produced and, um, and checked um, Zebrafinch assemblies before curation uh, against each other. It's the same species. They should align perfectly in a diagonal. They don't. After curation, it looks like this. This is your high C map. And after curation, the alignment of the two assemblies is perfect, um, apart from some haplotypic um, differences here. So this is what you can achieve with all these processes. So um, you might think now, uh, oh, this is a two-year undertaking. It's not. Uh, our GBA-based curation takes about one week to set up the database, and an experienced curator takes between three and five days to go through uh, an assembly of uh, one to two um, gigabase pairs. Um, we have significantly influenced uh, both assembly software and assembly strategy by uh, doing these things. And uh, I believe it's a really good thing, but sadly, it's not portable. It's totally wedded to the infrastructure at the Sanger Institutes. So if, you are, if I manage to convince you that assembly curation is a good thing, um, and you want to go ahead and do this, I've got some recommendations for you now to do it without the existence of GVAL uh, in your setup. 
Uh, and this basically boils down to three mantras. And the first mantra is align everything, really align everything you find. If you do so, you identify all the data sets in your project that you didn't want there, you remove them. You identify all the artifacts that you didn't want there and you remove them. You identify all the other species and the organelle bits that you didn't want in there and you remove them. So that is the whole decontamination approach here. Um, going into curation, also covered by aligning everything because you identify everything that is covered at an unusual uh, depth and you know that you need to either collapse it or decollapse it there. And you identify everything where alignments abruptly stop in cliffs or whether there are, uh, where there are other things going on, where alignments go from one bit to the next where you don't really expect them. And then you know where to break and join or rejoin your sequence. The second mantra is consult multiple data types. Um, I said earlier that uh, I see it's all good and well, but it might be misleading. Um, here's an example where the left picture, um, high C to D map of two scaffolds next to each other that form part of the same chromosomal unit, um, looks nice in the high C plot uh, with the joint that is shown here in the white circle. But this is actually the incorrect joint because if you then consult the bio nanomaps, you see that the joint actually has to be made at the other end of the 31 scaffold. And it looks a bit odd in the high C2D map, but this really is the confirmed and correct join. Um, the reason for this is that um, high C maps can often show what we call checkerboarding, which you can clearly see here. And um, only if you play around with the shading and saturation in the relevant map viewer, you can identify that even high C tells you this is the correct join. It's just not obvious if you are looking at it from a distance. So this really needs to be investigated in all detail that is available to you. Here's another um, example where high C can be misleading and we even see this in the <coughs> currently uh, state of the art um, high C scaffolding um, examples. And that is where high C scaffolding gets the order and orientation of whole chromosome arms wrong. Um, here you might be misled to believe that this left picture here is the correct high C map, but it's actually the second one that is the correct bit. And uh, in many species, you can see that um, the GC content increases towards the end of the chromosomes. Not, not everywhere, but in some species you can see this, and this would give you an additional indicator that this is the correct orientation. The same for the two high C plots on the right. The second from the right is the one that looks okay, but it's incorrect. And the one on the far right is the one that is correct for this particular scaffold or chromosome. And another type of evidence comes from identifying um, subcentromeric repeats and also telomeres that after the reorientation are exactly where you would expect them to be. So don't just trust one data type, always look at several different things. And thirdly, we would always recommend to keep track of all your changes that you're applying to your assembly, not only to learn from this, but also so that you have something to say when a collaborator asks you half a year down the line why you did a certain thing or whether you actually did it. So for this, we are employing a tracking database. In our case, it's Jira. And we lock in it all the project details for certain assembly. We lock in it all the additional data that we used for curating it. And we are logging in it all the decisions uh, that we made. Um, also, any additional data, screenshots, whatever data you want to store with the project. So we can always look it up. And uh, when someone is asked, they always have, have all information at hand that they need. Um, what we also do is, um, and, and this is a bit of the inner works of how the curation um, functions, we are using a, a file format for our curation that um, has been with us since the early days of the Human Genome Project, the so-called tile path format, which is basically just a very long list of what goes in what order on what. And you can see an example here on the top right. So we take an assembly that is delivered to us being called um, with, with components being called scaffold one arrow, for instance, or scaffold two arrow, et cetera, et cetera. And we chop this up 
into bits that can easily be handled. In our case, we are taking 500 KB bits. And um, the tile path format um, shows you um, the, the question mark is a placeholder for accessions, should you have it for these components. Um, in our case, obviously, we, we don't yet. So um, this shows you the, um, the scaffold that it belonged to. <coughs> and the dot number is the bit we chopped it into. So this would be um, bits, the artificial bits 32 to 39 of scaffold one arrow. We then give the scaffold um, another name here, whatever name you want to. And after curation, you can see that the curators decided to split the 35th bit of scaffold one arrow into two. Um, the exact coordinates of that are locked in our database. And they then inserted two gaps and another bit of, of scaffold 59 into the gap in the uh, reverse orientation. So this would then be the old structure of the assembly as it came out of the assembly pipeline. This would be the curator structure. And you can then just go and run scripts over this TPF and it stitches together the new final assembly that you would like to deliver. Um, at the same time, this TPF obviously gives you the full record of all the changes you've made because you can follow up all the naming, etc., and all the splits. So you always know what exactly you have done. Um, and that's basically already it with recommendations for your curation. Um, I've deliberately not uh, gone into details about what software we suggest to use and, and how to really do it in detail because uh, we've sort of written this up. Um, we've got a paper in, uh, on BioArchive, which has been submitted to a journal. We are waiting for the reviews, um, which basically tells you everything I've just told you. And we also um, wrote a little uh, manuscript on our curation recommendations for the Earth Biogenome Project, uh, which is out there on the web for you to use. Um, if you are interested in this, we will include the URLs for both in the um, email that goes out after the talk to all the participants. Um, this is it on curation, but I'd like to tell you just briefly about assembly standards. Um, so the VGP, the Vertebral Genome Project, has done all the legwork and defines assembly standards in uh, the flagship publication that is uh, about to be published soon, I hope. And um, they are using lots of different metrics for assemblies and um, the, the, the different categories and different metrics. And they, they define what uh, a draft, medium, high, and ultimately finished genome should look like according to those metrics. If you start here on the left, you have the uh, recently released uh, telomere to telomere assembly, which is at the highest level here and basically has everything flawless apart from remaining five gaps or something in, in really tricky regions. Then you have um, really high standards here. Um, that is something that the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium aims at. Then you have the Vertebra Genomes Project, which managed to get anywhere between medium and high in its quality. And uh, lastly, you have here the Earth Biogenome Project, which uh, sort of aims at a medium quality uh, of assemblies in order to um, allow for the more tricky species out there. So the recommendations for assembly measurements are that assemblies should have uh, a QV of at least 40, and the context should have an N50 of at least one megabase. Um, this obviously has to be adjusted for smaller species where one megabase might uh, exceeds chromosome length. Um, the EBP also um, recommends to produce assemblies that have uh, at least 90% of the sequence uh, assigned to chromosomes, less than 5% false duplications, more than 90% K-mer completeness, more than 90% gene completeness, uh, and that would be the Busco single copy, not the Busco uh, single duplicated and fragmented. Um, and also the EBP expects that more than 90% of the transcript from the same organism are mappable to the assembly that you've produced. For the assembly quality, this um, follows everything I've told you earlier. Um, only ATG, C and Ns uh, should be submitted, no trailing Ns. Decontamination and haplotype separation should have happened. And then basically all the structural issues should have been resolved 
Um, identification of sex chromosomes where possible, and of course, reconciliation of the known carrier type where it exists and where this is possible. The EBP also recommends that you submit your assemblies in a certain structure. So starting at the bottom left, your assembly would belong to a data by your project for your primary assembly and your alternate assembly for the other haplotype the, and the assembly for all cobions you might find in the same sample should have their individual data bio projects. Another data bio project should exist for all the raw data that you use to generate these assemblies. These all then can be um, collected and displayed uh, in a so-called umbrella bio project for your overall assembly project and this can be attached to whatever larger umbrella project you are running your um, project under. And at the same time, this also allows to um, order your project and attach it to the existing Earth Biogenome project, bio project. So that if someone looks up all the EVP um, assemblies, they can easily find yours as well. On top of that, and this is my last slide, the EBP um, recommends naming your uh, assemblies and samples um, in a certain fashion that has been pioneered by the Vertebrate Genome Project and is currently provided uh, as a suggestion of naming in a list um, from the Darwin Tree of Life Project. Um, so we recommend that you give all your samples a unique name and this name should consist of um, a prefix that starts with two lowercase letters for the wider plate, um, the first one, and the second letter for the sort of lower plate, so that these two letters give you an indication of uh, what kind of organism you are looking at. For instance, an IL would stand for insects, Lepidoptera. Um, uh, I, I think XG stands for a certain class of slugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this this is all defined, and you can look it up. Then this is followed by um, three letters for the genus and four letters um, for the species, and then a number for the individual that you've sampled so that you can tell different specimen apart. Um, for assemblies, we add another dot number for the version of the assembly that, that you've submitted. So here on the right, for instance, um, this is uh, Alcis repandata, and the sample here is called IL Alc Ripa 1, because that is the first Alcis repandata we've sequenced. And the assembly would be called il alcrepa 1.1 and following for future updates. Um, this facilitates recognition uh, and communication because it's so much easier to talk about il alcrepa than to talk about alcis repandata or that butterfly that you worked with last week. Um, it also supports um, taxonomy context because of the first two letters, you know roughly what you're talking about. For instance, that is not a plant. Um, you can look all this up um, at the URL I've uh, listed below here. We can also include that in the email if you're interested in this. And that's the end of my talk. And I just would like to acknowledge all the people who do all the work. That is the Genome Reference Informatics team at the Sanger Institute. Um, and here you see all the people that do all the decontamination and assembly processing, the GVAL production and data analysis, and also the hands-on manual curation. And thank you very much for listening. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Kirsten, for your insightful look at assembly validation. Immediately after your opening remarks, we had some funny comments on Twitter expressing disappointment that you were not here to tell us about the one perfect assembler or data type that could provide all the answers. But in all seriousness, we really appreciate your uh, words of caution and wisdom. So now's the time for you in the audience to send through your questions. Uh, please type anything you'd like Kirsten to address into the Q&A box now. There's already some questions there that we can start with. Uh, Kirsten, I hope you can see the Q&A box. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I actually scroll to the bottom, which is uh, not the right order in time, but maybe I just start there. <laughs> so uh, Kinsa Azif asks, how do we remove duplicated assembly, which software or manually? You can do both. Um, what we use is something called uh, Perch Dupes, written by Dang Fang Guan, 
um, that looks at sequences that are very similar to each other and also have reduced coverage as you would expect for duplications. And it then removes this automatically. So that really would be my first choice. If you then go to a detailed menu curation, you will identify further uh, false duplications that might have been missed by the software, but purge dupes is a very good start. Um, Mm. Someone asks uh, here, Nick Wong, sorry, in Nupa, genome assembly with a comment about consulting multiple data types, does it matter that the sample from which the data was generated from was actually from different individuals of that species you are trying to sequence? Any tips to account for this? For instance, intraspecies variation. So we'd always recommend to run your whole assembly project on one single individual, wherever this is possible. Sequencing has made it possible to generate genome assemblies from uh, immensely small organisms like a single mosquito. I don't know, Nick, what you are working with. I hope uh, it's at least that size or a bit bigger. If so, go for one single individual and try to go for the um, um, sex that has two different sex chromosomes. Otherwise, you're obviously missing one. Um, if you can't do this and you have to put several different individuals in, then I would recommend to go for one individual to, do, um, to produce the initial context. And if you then have to go to a different individual, try to get all the long read data from it, the long range data. Because um, the differences between individuals from the same species will matter less long range. So um, this is what we do. For instance, we would generate PacBio data from one individual. And if we really have to, the high C data can come from a different individual. One word of caution here, if you generate, for instance, high C data from a different individual and it has a different sex, the maps look very funny. So don't do that. Um, then Lorenzo Bertola asks, what added value can a high density linkage map add to a genome assembly? paired with something like Hi-C. Can they be used to confirm the karyotype uh, in conjunction with Hi-C mapping? Yes, definitely they can. And um, genome maps is something we frequently use. Um, we actually align all the markers in GVAL and we point out all the locations that uh, are not according to plan. You can, um, with different types of Hi-C map visualizers, um, attach um, information like um, mapping markers. So for instance, if you use um, tools like um, Juicebox, um, High Glass or Pretext, you can load your marker mappings into them and make all this visible at the same time and, and deal with it accordingly. Kinsa Asif then asks, um, any best assemblers for viruses? I, Unfortunately, I have to pass on that one. I have not assembled viruses, but I would expect that uh, the shorter the genome, the easier it is to get at it with uh, long reads. Um, he also asked, um, I used Unicycle and Canoe for the novel assembly of an avian virus, um, but the assembly I got is double the size of the viral genome. What could be the reason? As I said, I don't really know for viruses, but purge loops might uh, again be a good recommendation to look at this. Um, given that your viral genome is very, very small, align it against itself and see what pops out of this. Um, Lorenzo Bertola asks um, what my thoughts are on the many fields of using draft and non-complete genome assemblies to study genome-wide diversity, um, for instance, speciation genomics. To what degree do you think incomplete or suboptimal assemblies are affecting the identified patterns and resulting inferences. Um, so uh, for every assembly, I'd say you need to make it as good as you need for the original question you want to ask this assembly. So if you are only into gene structures, uh, suboptimal assembly might be totally your thing because you can already identify all gene structures. If you are after um, assembly or genome structure as a whole and you want to compare this to other species, um, any error you have in your assembly will obviously affect the outcome of your investigations. Um, I believe there is uh, something in the VGP flagship paper on the um, issues that might come from this. 
um, we would always recommend that before you um, rely on a certain finding when you compare suboptimal assemblies from different species, that you at least interrogate the specific locations in all those assemblies that you believe are meaningful so that you can be sure that you are not uh, following an artifact in your analysis. But yeah, I, I recommend caution here. Um, then we have... There's a, there's a question hiding over in the chat box as well. I can read it out to you. It's, okay. um, uh, Andy asks, what are your thoughts on the pan genome instead of a single genome approach? There seems to be some interest in using this in microbes, humans and plants. So um, we are part of the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, which sets out to sequence at least 350 people and produce fully haplotype resolved flawless assemblies of those. And then uh, unite them all in a pan genome graph. I think this is a fantastic idea because once there, it will allow you to look at every single part of the genome in the context of all the other assemblies, ethnicities, individual variation that is out there. But what we need for this is a good toolbox. Um, you can have the most fantastic pan genome graph if you don't have the tools to annotate it, interrogate it, and analyze it and also visualize it, um, it, it, it won't catch. So um, the HPRC is currently tasked with not only developing the pun genome graph, but also with developing this toolkit. And I hope that in the next couple of years, we will see real rapid and fundamental advances in that area. And I think this is the way to go forward. We're, we're coming up to the hour now. So I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I'd like to once again thank you, Kirsten, for taking this time to share your knowledge, especially at such an early hour in your part of the world. And I'll draw thank the presentation. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We'd like to acknowledge our funding. The Australian BioCommons is enabled by NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>